Hello guys, got the rebuild video here for you today on the Day State Delta Wolf but before we get into the rebuild of the rifle I just thought we'd talk a little about exactly how these electronic rifles work. So I've laid out the main components here, there are very many more in the rifle but these ones are the ones that make it work. At the bottom here we have the bolt obviously, here we have the coil, we have the hammer up here, the valve and the trigger. So the way this little setup works is that the bolt controls how much voltage and for how long that voltage is applied to the coil. When the coil receives a charge or is energised, the hammer is pulled through it. The hammer is obviously steel and when the coil is energised it pulls the hammer through the middle there and the hammer hits the valve. So a very simple thing indeed. So the valve is obviously just a knockoff type valve. We will talk a little more about that when we get to rebuilding it, but the valve just simply, when depressed, allows air to pass through this transfer port hole here and behind the pellet, or into the barrel which pushes the pellet out the end of it. The trigger at the bottom here is quite simply a little switch. When we pull the trigger, this little grey part here is depressed, and that tells the board to energise the coil. And that is a very, very basic idea of how this little rifle works. Now the reason I wanted to explain that is to sort of talk through some of the advantages of this type of setup. So the main advantage of a setup like this is it does away with tons of variables. We no longer have to worry about trigger sears and how they interact with the hammer. Obviously a trigger sear is always in contact with the hammer and as we pull it back using the cocking lever it latches at some point in the hammer. The way the trigger sear is released from the hammer can have a tremendous effect on what the hammer does after it's released. If the trigger spring hangs or drags along the side of the hammer, that can cause you great amount of inconsistencies. And just the way the trigger sear is released from the hammer itself can affect the speed and the way that the hammer is released. This setup obviously does away with all of that as we have a trigger that is digital. It's either on or off, there's no in between. There's no hanging, there's nothing like that, it's either on and the coil is energised or it's off and the coil is dead. We also don't have to worry about the hammer spring and how it releases or how it unwinds. We don't have to worry about spring fatigue or anything like that. This setup, if left alone and if working correctly, should produce exactly the same result each and every time. Springs can lose their springiness after some time and they are also fairly sensitive to changes in temperature. We also don't have to worry about how exactly the hammer goes up the middle or the hammer tube. So in this setup the hammer is a fairly loose fit in the coil itself but because of the way the coil actually works the hammer will always be pulled up the exact centre of the coil. It's being pulled by each and every direction so up, down, left, right in exactly the same way. So what it does is it effectively floats in the middle. There should, in a system like this, be no friction or touching of the hammer in the sides there. There may be some as the hammer hits. The force will obviously cause the hammer to slightly ricochet, but that's normal and shouldn't affect the way the rifle shoots. So the hammer is pulled up the exact centre of the coil itself and so we don't have to worry about friction or any inconsistencies caused by that. Another advantage of a setup like this is the fine tunability of the board itself. Because the FAC rifles, not so much the Sub-12, but definitely the FAC rifles, we can control the amount of voltage and the time that, that voltage is applied to the coil. That gives us a tremendous amount of fine tune adjustment when we're playing around with the rifle itself. So the two controlling factors are voltage and time. They can be thought of as your hammer spring. So the voltage in this instance would be the strength of the spring itself. The higher the voltage, the stiffer the spring. The time would be comparable to spring length. So the longer the spring, the more time the hammer is under the influence of spring tension, or in this case, electromagnetic pull. So hopefully that sort of gives you an idea of how these rifles work. Again, that's just a cursory look at it. If you do have an FAC version of this, I would highly recommend having a play around with the tune in itself. But hopefully that's given you a little idea of how these rifles work. So now we can get onto the rebuild. And we can start rebuilding the rifle now. So we're going to start where we left off last time and we're going to rebuild this back piece first. First thing we're going to do is re-plug in the board here. So this is just the little interface cable in the side here. 
we're going to plug that in nice and firmly then angle the board itself into the back here it does take a little bit of wiggling but if you get it at the right angle it sort of slips in there nice and easily next before the screws back go back in we're going to reinstall the coil so we'll put the sheath over the coil up in the rifle like so and with the wire pointing downwards we'll push that in the back it like so. Next we're going to reinstall these screws for the bolt. so here's the screws. Upon further inspection these little screws here do have a little plastic washer between the screw head and the bolt itself. So a little insulating pad there. They did stay on when I first took the bolt out but then on closer inspection I noticed them and just pulled them off so they didn't get lost. In nice and careful. Now before we do them up tight we're just going to get both screws started and that's using a T4 piece or a T4 Torx bit. Once the screws are tight what we're going to do next is just reinstall all the backing pieces for the coil. So first is this plastic piece here and this slot goes downwards get that lined up, push that in, make sure it's seated home and we'll drop the hammer through like so and then finally we'll reinstall this little locking piece at the back here so first of all it goes in like so and then pushing it down and using something like an allen key to twist it if you push it down it's nice and easy, they are spring loaded and all that does is keep the coil exactly where it needs to be. Next up what we're going to do is reinstall the little connection wires, these two here, into the board. So using something nice and plastic or non-conductive, I'm going to gently tease the wires in, being nice and careful that we don't damage anything. So. Just going to use the plastic pick to push the wires in, then using a flat bladed screwdriver, a nice small one, I'm going to do these connections up. Those connections there want to be done up nice and tight, but not so tight as that you damage the actual mounting point to the board itself. It's only soldered on there, so excessive force could break it. Next, we're going to reinstall the screen. So before we start we'll pull this little black part down here, these two tabs and then gently push the ribbon cable in making sure it's nice and seated then those two black pieces we're just going to press forward so you see there the two pieces are forward and that's locked the ribbon cable into position Next, we'll fold down the screen, making sure nothing's pinched. And then using two screws, we'll put the screen back on. Doing them up with a 2mm Allen key. We will put this little hammer spring return spring in there. All that spring does is keep the hammer pushed to the back of the coil so that it's at a repeatable position each and every time the rifle is fired. If the hammer was loose and sort of at the front here, you fired the rifle, you'd get less power than if the hammer was at the back. So this spring just keeps the hammer at a consistent distance from the valve itself. Right, that's the back piece done, so we can put this to one side and bring back the next assembly. Right then, so next up we're going to rebuild the valve, that's the next thing to go in. But before we do, I just want to say that my friend has got his hands on a new style valve. So this one was the one that's in the older rifles. This rifle itself is about 18 months old and was one of the first Delt Wolves actually released. So this is the old style of valve here. This one at the bottom is new. So if we look at the valve pins themselves, there are a couple little changes to them. 
So the first one is that this shaft is beefier, so it's a larger diameter. The O-ring is in a slightly different position. They seem to be the same length or thereabouts. The material at the end here on the old one looks like Delrin and on the new ones it looks like Peak. So there are some other small changes there. You can see the flutes in the valve itself. That's probably for a higher flow rate of air. But there we have it, those are the valve pins. This one at the bottom is the newer one. This one at the top is the older style. So the newer one, slightly beefier, with some fluting in the valve pin and also a different sealing material. So peak instead of delrin. So it's good to see a couple of little upgrades on the valve itself. Peak is generally a better sealing surface for valves as delrin over time tends to deform and what it does is it increases the surface area of the valve and makes it less or more susceptible to leaks. The actual bodies look the same, so we look inside there. This is the older one, this is the newer one. So the bodies look the same, obviously a slightly different diameter in the ends there, but they still have all the same features, same flats and everything like that. So that one was the older one, this one was the newer one. The backs look almost the same again. So this is the newer one, this is the older one. So newer one, older one. Same features. The newer one has a slightly different pin in it. So this is the sub-12 valve. I'm led to believe by a good friend of mine that the FAC valve is slightly different. I'm going to talk a little bit about that in a minute. So this pen here is very tight in there. I couldn't manage to get it out. I didn't want to damage anything so I didn't try very very hard, I probably could have if I gave it a good yank but I didn't want to mar up the pin itself so I just left it in there. So the older one here came apart nice and easily, you can see the pin, the spring seat here, so this spring here rides on the spring seat and the seal, this one, the newer one looks like it uses an o-ring rather than these hard plastic seals. The spring seat itself is slightly different in the newer valves. So, as you can see there, this is the new one, it's a top hat design, whereas the old one was just a flat disc of material. The springs look and feel the same, maybe slightly heavier on the new one, although it's very hard to tell. Right then, I just want to talk briefly about the FAC valves and one comment that a user left on the disassembly video. So a viewer on the previous video asked the question, why doesn't Daystate use a balance valve? So very quickly, for those of you who don't know, a balance valve is a valve that is balanced. What that means is typically a valve only sees pressure in one direction when it's sealed. So if we look at this valve here, we have spring tension on the back here, and we also have regulator pressure pressing the valve closed. So in here there is a seat, the regulator pressure and spring tension is pushing the valve closed against the sealing face and then obviously when our hammer hits the valve it overcomes both of those forces, opens the valve and allows air to pass out. A balanced valve on the other hand is a valve which the regulator pressure is balanced on both sides, meaning that the regulator pressure is acting in the closing valve direction and also the opening valve direction. Now I haven't seen the FAC balance valve but I'm led to believe by a good friend that it is balanced. And I can see exactly how it would work with the assembly in the back here. So what I believe happens, I haven't seen one again, but what I believe happens is the valve at the back here is longer with a piston which rides in this bore. What that would do is with a longer valve with a piston on this end the air in here would be acting both in shutting the valve and opening the valve, as it would be pushing the valve this way. The only thing that would be in sealing the valve, the sealing valve direction, would be the spring tension itself. Again, I haven't seen one, but that's how I believe it would work. So, you may be asking yourself, why don't they put the balance valve in sub-12 rifles? And I believe the answer to that question is that the whole point of a balance valve is to reduce the opening effort that the valve itself needs. So you reduce the amount of energy that the valve needs to open. For FAC rifles that means that you can have a higher power without having to smash the valve open using a very heavy hammer, very heavy spring and all that sort of thing. 
The downside to that is that the lighter you make that opening effort, the more susceptible to inconsistencies it is. So I believe for the sub-12 rifles it was probably a little inconsistent using a balance valve. But the valves themselves are very easy to assemble, so I'll just assemble the older one and the newer one so you can see exactly how it works. Small amount of silicon grease on this o-ring here. That goes in the bore like so. The spring goes on the back. The o-ring goes in the hole there. And we're just going to seat that using a 5mm allen key, like so. A pin can then be pushed through. A little stiff, but it goes in there. And then the top seal can go on, or the top seat, I should say, the spring seat. Next, with a valve like so, what we do is we hook one side in, like that. And then just simply rotate the valve over till it locks in position. So I'll do the new one as well. Small amount of silicon grease. Put the valve in. A spring on the back. Now since this one, the pin and the O-ring are already in there, we're just going to drop the spring seat on there. And there we have it. So we're going to be installing the new valve and I'll put this one to one side. We can bring the block of the rifle back in. Put a good amount of silicon grease around all these O-rings. They is fairly tight in the block, so we're going to lube them up nicely. Then with the transfer port or the airway facing upwards, gently push the valve in. The ears of the valve do lock into the rifle itself so just make sure the valve is locked the two flaps on the side there need to be facing side to side so there they are there the o-rings on the outside can be pushed in so we have the smaller one on the inside the larger one on the outside now again I don't have the sizes for you they're not publicly available my friend just bought a o-ring kit he bought it off a of day state and I just mixed and matched the O-rings. So I took the old ones out, looked at them and matched the new ones with the kit he bought. Next we're going to screw on this little cover piece here. We're just going to do that up nice and tight. Like so. And there we have it. There's the valve back in the rifle. Next up we're going to be rebuilding the regulator, so we have the pieces to the regulator here and again I have replaced the o-rings off camera. But very easy to take off and replace, I just cut mine off with a scalpel being nice and careful not to mark the underlying material. So we can get started in rebuilding now. First of all what we're going to do is add a small amount of silicon grease to the top and bottom o-ring of the regulator piston itself, like so. Next we're going to put the piston in the base of the regulator, nice and gently. There we have it there. Next we're going to put the ceiling puck in. So here's the ceiling puck. This is a humor one, so if you look very closely, I'm not sure if the camera is going to pick this up, but it does have a dimple on one side. I don't know if the camera is going to pick that up at all. There is a dimple on one side and we're going to flip it. Drop that in there, and it did. It landed dimple side down, so we can go ahead and reinstall our regulator adjuster screw. So, again, small amount of silicon grease, wiping off the excess, and then gently pushing the piston or the adjuster screw into the top there, and using a flat bladed screwdriver doing that up. The reason we flip the ceiling puck is just because it's marked on one side and the other side should be nice and clean, which it was. The dimple can sometimes have an effect. Normally with the humor rigs in the rebuild kits you do get a spare puck. But this one, because it's dual sided and both sides, or only one side seals at a time, it is 
flippable. Next we're going to put some serpent grease on these external O-rings and then we're going to put it in the rifle itself. So nice and carefully pushing the O-rings into the block and then doing it up. We've screwed the adjuster screw all the way until it touches, then backed it out a quarter of a turn and we'll readjust the regulator pressure at a later date when we get everything built up again. Next I'm just going to install the gauge to get it out of the way. I've already put the o-ring back in the hole, just with a small amount of silicon grease and then the gauge itself just needs to be done up hand tight with the aligned, well get it aligned with the top. Next we're going to put the regulator pressure sensor in, so this part here. So first of all we'll drop the o-ring in just with a bit of silicon grease on our fingers. Get that seated in the bottom there. And then with our regulator pressure sensor we'll fish the wire through the back here. So it comes out in the trigger well. We'll put sensor down in the hole get it started and then gently screw the brass retaining nut on. Now to undo this we did it with a punch. I did that because I thought the actual screw itself was going to be tighter than it actually was. However to do it up what we're going to be using is a pair of these expanding or squeeze to contract circlet pliers. So very simply we're just going to carefully move the wires out of the way, get the ends into the slots of the brass part there, and just gently do them up. This does do up onto a fairly squidgy o-ring, so it won't do up super tight, but it should start to go stiff, and that's when we're going to leave it. So just fish the wire through. We want a nice bit of slack on that before we get it installed with the trigger itself. Next we're just going to install the foster fitting. So this part here, it's got the doughty washer on the bottom there. We're going to do that up. Then using a deep 10mm socket we'll do that up nice and tight. And there we have it. That is the rifle sealed up. If we wanted to at the moment what we could do is reinstall the bottle and pressure test the rifle. Now if you did decide to do that what you would need to do before going forward with the assembly is take the bottle off and then dry fire the valve or just lightly hit the valve at the back here with a hammer to drain the air out. Obviously we want to reassemble the rest of the rifle with no air in it just in case. But if you did want to leave this to pressure test overnight you could do so in that way. Next what we're going to do is get the trigger reinstalled and the wiring harness at the top. Right then, so here's all the trigger components here. We're just going to start putting things back together. So first of all, get the trigger in the front there. Realign the little hole for the pin. Push the pin through and that captivates the trigger. Next up we'll put the trigger in itself. So this is the trigger switch. Just align that like so. Then using the little screws, pop them in the holes. And we'll do them up with a cross-headed screwdriver. Like so. Next what we're going to do is put the trigger safety on, or the safety switch on. And we're going to put the switch in there, then put the screws in. And again, doing them up with a cross-headed screwdriver. Very important to be careful with the safety switch itself. Any sort of sidewards pressure on this switch here can cause this shoe to become dislodged. We definitely don't want that, so just nice and careful when you're operating it. Next, we're just going to put the push the top mount connector in. So that's the trigger safety on there. And the next one we're going to put in is the pressure sensor at the base here. 
before we do that though, what we're going to do is fish the main harness wires through the block itself. So the wire we want to fish through is this one. It's the longer top mount connector and what that does is it goes through the top there and we're going to push a bit through to give us a bit of extra slack. So nice and carefully pull that through. Like so. Next what we're going to do is fish the regulator pressure sensor wire through. You could, if you wanted to, do this before you put the trigger safety on. That would make it a little easier to do. I like to do it this way, though as getting the screws started with everything in the way is a bit of a pain. That goes in like so. And then finally, attach the top mount connector for the harness. Next what we can do is take this little 3D printed cover piece, hook the wires through and then do up the little two cross headed screwdriver parts here. What that will do is lock in all the connections and stop them from coming undone. They are only top mount so they're just friction mounted. Next we've got to be very careful with this little trigger shoe here. So as you saw there we was putting the wires in and being nice and careful. If you do press it too hard, what you will do is dislodge the actual switch itself and it's a bit of a pain to get back on. It is doable but it is a pain. So we want to avoid that if best possible. Next thing we need to do though is reinstall the safety bar. So very simply, take the bar, put it through one side, it does have a side, the does have a side, these little dimples here line up with this side or the right hand side of the rifle. So put that in first, then the other side can be screwed in nice and easily. Just making sure that both sides are in seated correctly, like so. But once that's done we can push the trigger unit back up into the rifle. So, nice and carefully. So get it roughly where it needs to be, then using the screws, just do them up with a 2mm allen key. Don't do them up tight as you will need to readjust the trigger position, just to wrangle it into position. Being nice and careful obviously that we don't damage any of the main harness wires as they are fairly fragile. I just want to mention something to the people that have got the conversion kits for the Alpha Wolf and that is be very very careful of installing the trigger safety sp spacers. When you do put them in make sure you only take one side out at a time and using your other hand keep a nice firm even pressure on the back as you undo and reinstall the new safety spacer. If you don't do that and allow the bar to be pushed through the rifle it will dislodge that little that little trigger safety switch and it is a pain to get back on. So just when you're doing your conversion keep a nice firm pressure on one side, don't let the bar fall through the rifle and just take it nice and slow. As long as you do that there's nothing to worry about. But next we're gonna reinstall the bottom piece here and all that will do is make sure that the rifle sits a little nicer as we're working on it. So 3mm allen key, doing up all the screws one by one. Turn that up nice and tight. Next we'll flip the rifle over, not forgetting to put our little magnetic filler cap back on. But we'll flip the rifle over and reinstall this little plastic part here. Now this does have a way up, it goes up this way in the rifle. If you get it round the wrong way what will happen is you won't be able to push your barrel in. So just make sure that's at the right angle or the right position. And we'll lay the wiring harness over the top. Right then, so next we're going to fit the top rail. First of all what we're going to do is install this little switch here. This little switch, there's two holes in the switch itself. 
hopefully you can see that there, and there's two little nobbles or nibs in here which those two holes have to lock into. Like so. Next up, what we're going to do is put the top rail back over. So you'll note that my cocking handle is flipped to the other side. Don't worry, I'll show you at the end of the video how to flip it back. But we're going to just lay that over the top gently for now. And before we go any further, I'm just going to add a small amount of lithium grease to a few surfaces in the rifle itself. So this top part here, this is just ordinary lithium grease. So this part is where the actual cocking mechanism or the whole top rail with the pallet probe attached moves forwards and backwards. So a little bit of grease on that is very beneficial. Put a little bit over here as well, as this is where the cocking arm sort of opens and closes. You can see there's a little wear on that, but that's all right. A little bit of grease. And then, same thing, we're going to put a little bit of grease on the bottom of the mechanism here itself. And just a, a small amount in this little channel. A little space apart runs through there, so we want that to be nice and smooth. But once that's done, we can take our switch wire, feed that through, or fish it through. A little slot in the back there. The wire did come off the nobbles but that's all right we can put that back. Once the rail's on top there it actually keeps the switch nice and captive. Next up we're gonna reinstall this little aluminium channel. First of all though we're just gonna put a small amount of lithium grease on the top of the rail or the bottom of this part. Just a small amount will do you. Using lithium grease in this instance as it's not really a high wear item just wants a little bit of grease just to take off that metal on metal feeling. Next up we'll take our channel and fish the wire through this part here. Nice and carefully, like so. Before that goes on, what we'll do is we'll put our little, these two little spaces, there's one at the front, one at the back, so one here and one roughly here. We're going to put that in like so, and this is a little tip, if you put a little bit of grease on a component that you want to stick to a piece of material, a little bit of grease just helps it stick there. It doesn't stick it fast like glue or anything like that, but it does help it stay in place as you manoeuvre parts around it. And as long as you're nice and careful it should stay exactly where you want it to stay. Next we'll just add the little screws back in. And then using a flat bladed screwdriver we'll just do them up. Next what we'll do is we'll just lay the wires in where they need to be. So this one needs to just be pushed in the back here. There is still a small amount of hot glue from the factory, we're just going to leave that on. And next we're going to lay the main wiring harness over the top, the wire in the hole there. Then finally at the back here we're just going to reconnect the cocking switch to the harness. Nice and carefully. And there we have it. Alright, that's that done. Next I'm just going to loosely reinstall the cocking handle so the bolt goes through the arm there. You can just loosely do that up. I won't bother doing it up tight as I will be taking it off later when we flip the cocking handle to the other side. You don't need to take apart the whole rifle to flip the cocking, you don't even need to take the top rail off. So once the rifle's built back up I'll show you exactly how to take that off and flip it to the other side. Very simple. Next I'm just going to hook the little cover plate into the other side here. The grease will keep it in place. Next what we're going to do is just reinstall a little brass bush, so again, small amount of lithium grease over this. And then we're going to bring back the top rail. So I've left the screws in and I've taken the four at the back out for the back piece, we'll be putting them in shortly. There they are, so two shorter ones at the front, two longer ones in the middle and two shorter ones near the back again. 
So the two long ones correspond with the cocking handle, or the cocking arm I should say. And we're going to lay that wire over there like so. Lay the top rail over. Just loosely for now, we're going to have to sort out the wires underneath. Make sure nothing's pinched. So, the back's fine. The front, what we can see in there, is that a couple of wires need to, a little bit of attention. So we're just going to gently pull this connection forward. And then using a thin Allen key, so just a 2mm one, gently going to tease the wires into a better position so they don't get caught as we push the top rail down. And there we have it. So I can see there that there's no daylight in there with no pressure so no wires are pinched. So wires are nice and free. You definitely don't want to pinch the wires. They are only thin and when you do the screws up they will get cut. But with a 3mm Allen key we're just going to do these screws up. Get them all started first then go round and nip them all up. We are doing this in a slightly different order in which we took it apart in. I'll explain the reason for that in a minute shortly. And we'll do that when we put the back piece back on. And before we tighten all the screws up, just making sure that the rail itself is evenly spaced and not kinked on the rifle. There we have it. So the cocking handle, nice and free still, no friction there at all, so that can be left as it is. Next we're going to reinstall this little front piece here. So this is the extension, or this wire here is the extension piece for the chronograph. So what we're going to do, hook this little connection down, like so, plug it in. They do have a way around these connections. I've taken quite a few of these apart and I can just see which way they go round. But the pins are closer to one side than the other. So next we can reinstall the two screws on the top here. So these are shorter screws. But if you need a reference, that's the length of the screw there. So slightly shorter than the ones in the front here. And again we're going to do them up with a 3mm Allen key. Just making sure the gap on each side is nice and even, then doing them up nice and tight. Right then, next up we can reinstall this back piece. So I wanted to do it in a slightly different order in which we took it apart in, just to show you that you don't have to take the top rail off to gain access to the valve. If you want to, what you could do is take off these four screws in the top, remove the little pellet probe backing piece here, so this screw would normally be in there. We take that out, unhook the wires, so disconnect this wire from this back piece and finally loosen this grub screw on this side and you would be able to slide this back piece off and gain access to the valve. So if you had an o-ring that you wanted to change or you got the new style valve you could do that without taking the top rail off. And then quite simply to put it back on what we have to do, flip it over see the wire in here we're just going to push that down into the cutout so it doesn't get pinched put the top piece or the back piece on and slide it forward like so the wire is nice and free it's not pinched or anything like that so from this side what we can do do this grub screw up to the touches and then what I'm going to do is back it off quarter of a turn. What this will allow is when we do these screws up here, the four in the top, it will allow this bottom piece to rotate exactly where it needs to be, then we'll do this grub screw up afterwards. So we'll drop the four bolts in and do them up with a 3mm Allen key. There we have it. Once those four bolts are done up tight, we can do this one in the side. Again, 3mm Allen key. Next, we can 
reconnect the little wire here. So this one in the back corresponds with the top connection. We're just going to push that home nice and firmly like so. Next we can push the wire into position and then secure it using this screw here. Doing that up with a 3mm Allen key. We will install the battery last, so I'll leave the backing piece off for now. Next up, we'll put the top rail and the cheek piece back on. So, first of all, make sure all the bolts are loose, which these ones are. Slide the top rail, then slide the top rail over the dovetail. Get it to rough position, then from this side, we're just going to use a 3mm Allen key to nip these screws up. Very similarly for the back piece or the cheek piece, stick it on this side. I am right handed so we're going to stick it on this side. And then do the screws up with a two and a half mil allen key. Just get them touching and that secures the cheek piece, stops it from moving. Once that's done we can put the grip back on. So first thing we're going to do is align the safety to sort of upright. Then using this pin here we'll drop it in the hole. Once that's on we can put the grip back on. If you are wanting to replace this with an Ergo one or something similar, just make sure it's got this little hole in it. As long as it's got that hole it'll work. But put that in like so. Open the back cap and then with the grip screw using a 5mm allen key, put that in the base. Doing that up nice and tight. Then closing the back cap. There we have it. Right then, that's the gun pretty much fully assembled. What we're going to do is stick this to one side and bring back the barrel with the chronograph. So these are the pieces here. First thing we're going to do, make sure the chronograph lenses are nice and clean. We cleaned them in the previous video, but they're clean. We'll screw that on. Being nice and careful of the chronograph part itself, so I'll just move that over to one side. Doing that up nice and tight. So to align it, what we need to do is align this or the flat at the top here with the switch. So get them nice and aligned. I'm going to put the barrel in the vise and just tighten this up till they're aligned. And there we have it. As you can see now, the flat is corresponding with the wires at the back here. So next we're going to take our little chronograph piece, just gently, very very gently, so this is only a very tiny circuit board, just push it nice and neatly into place like so. Now I've got the two or two of the o-rings still on the barrel here and I've taken another two off, or we took another two off in the previous part, so we're just going to gently tease them o-rings over the top there. First one secures the wire, and the second one you push up around to the secure the chronograph itself. The other two O-rings I've got here, but we'll stretch the first one over, and then the second. Rolling that down, so there we have it three o-rings over the chronograph itself with another securing the wire at the back. Next what we'll do is we'll take our carbon tube with the two grub screws aligned with the two cutouts in the carbon. Next we'll put the grub screws back in. Get them started by hand first and then doing them up with a two and a half mil allen key. And finally, we'll just put the thread protector on. Thread on this barrel is an M20, although the newer ones should come with half inch UNF, so this is an older rifle, as I said before. But there we have it. Next, we can put the barrel back in the rifle. So, with the transfer port, this little tiny part here pointing downwards, we'll gently feed the barrel through the rifle. And finally, just make sure the chronograph seats nicely at the back here. So the KISS connectors, or POGO connectors I think they're called, go in there nice and easily. Finally, do that up with a 3mm Allen key. 
The only other thing I will mention about the barrel is that there are two sealing o-rings inside the block here, so roughly one here and one here, and they seal the transfer port from leaking out both sides of the barrel. I did replace them off camera, they are a pain to do. You can however do them by just taking the barrel out. So I did mine. But with that done, what we can do now is put the battery back in the rifle. So here's our battery. With the tags pointing up. Just connect that like so. And then gently push the battery down. Again, I've put this little tag to make removing the battery nice and easy. But there we have it. Next we'll slide the back piece over. Nice and simple. And as you see there, or well hopefully you should see, that the rifle lights up and acts as it should. We'll test that it fires. We've obviously got no air, but you heard there, it fires. So. Hopefully, with a bit of luck, we put some air in this thing and it will work perfect. And finally, what we'll do is we'll put our bottle on. So I can't remember exactly how much air this bottle has, but it should be enough just to test the rifle. Get it so that the bottle touches, like so, and then nice and quickly do the bottle up. I can't hear any major leaks, and so hopefully we'll be good. We have only got 100 bar in the rifle, so I'm going to fill that up quickly. And then we'll readjust the reg pressure, and I'll flip the cocking handle over for you. Right then, so I've filled the rifle up. Hopefully you can see that there. We're just under 200 bar. And next, what we're going to do is reset the reg pressure. So just waking the rifle up by flicking the power on and off, or safety on and off. What we're going to do is readjust the reg pressure using this little screw here. So with a flat bladed screwdriver, we are just going to do a little bit at a time. This rifle was set to about 90 bar, so glare on the screen there, but we're about 64 there now. I can't adjust and show the camera unfortunately, it's just not enough room. 74 bar, nice and easy with a digital gauge like this. 88, so we were set at about 92, 93 last time, so I just got up a hair more. So 91, we'll give it a couple dry fires, make sure that the regulator settles where it needs to settle. So we're bang on where we need to be, around 91 bar, that's perfect. This is our 2.2 sub 12, so it was set to about 92 before we started messing with it. And one bar isn't going to make that much difference. Next I'll just show that the chrono still works. So what I'll do is I'll hand load a pellet. This is one of those horrible lead free pellets but I'm going to put one in. But there we go. 597. So the chrono raft's still working. Perfect. So all the features on the rifle are working exactly how they should. Exactly how they were before we took it apart. The very last thing I'm going to show you is how to flip the cocking handle over. So the cocking arm, sorry. What we're going to do first is unscrew the cocking lever. So this was only done up loosely, as I said before. We were going to flip it, no point doing it up tight. Next we're going to loosen the rail and move it. What we need to do is gain access to these two screws. So we'll loosen the rail, move it back slightly and undo these two screws here. So one on this side houses the cocking plate. The one on this side is for the cocking arm itself. We'll get them loosened off and taken out. Like so. Move the cocking arm and then from this side just push through so that the plate comes off. Next, we're going to loosen this single screw here. So with a flat bladed screwdriver, get it in the hole there and undo it. Set of tweezers, just take that out. Next, pull the cocking arm out and flip it over. So 
put it back on this side. There are two pins here, so one and two. Hopefully you can see them. The two pins correspond with the front and back holes in the side plate here. So the three holes there, one of them is for the screw and the other two are for these little pins. Like that. From this side now we can drop the screw back in and do it back up. Next what we'll do is we'll put our cover plate back on like so and then drop our screws in, redo them up, 3mm allen key again Then we'll move our rail back to where it needs to be and retighten it. Finally, put our cocking handle on, just put the bolt through the hole, do it up, two and a half mil Allen key, just tighten it. Right then, guys, so that's pretty much it for the rifle itself. We've successfully taken it apart, rebuilt it. Nothing scary about these rifles. They are electronic, but once you understand how the electronics work, they do operate very, very similar to a mechanical rifle. And as I said at the start of the video, I really do think that electronic rifles do away with tons of the inconsistencies that we do get with the mechanical rifles. I'm not saying that they're overall blanket just better, but what I am saying is that they are beneficial to the air gun market. Loads of people seem to have a negative opinion on electronic rifles. There's sort of some boogeyman and misconceptions about how they work. So hopefully by seeing how they work, having a little bit of that explained to you, you might have a better understanding of why I like electronic rifles. I was hesitant at first, but I do like them overall and why I think the Delta Wolf is a really nice rifle for the UK and FAC markets. It's a shame, it's a real real shame that we don't get the tunability that the FAC ones do. I would love to see or be able to tune the rifle. I think that would be fantastic for a Sub-12. But obviously Day State have got a factor in the Sub-12 law and the easily adjustable rifles and all of that. So I do understand why they don't have it enabled on the Sub-12. Hopefully though, in the future we may get some of that programmability. I would like to see it so that we could do it on a laptop. That way it wouldn't be easily adjustable in a field, but if you did want to have a play around with your laptop connected, you could connect it, tune it as you like, get the feet per second, get the voltage and all of that where it needs to be, then take it to the range and try it. But anyway guys, that's going to about do it for this one. So thanks for watching, and I'll see you in the next one.